Ladies and gentlemen, we have him here. Brad, first time ever on Tour Life officially. You've been in the, you've been in the background a few times, but officially first time. How are we doing, brother? Dude, I'm in shock. What's going on here? Why does it look like you're about to take your first day of school photo? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Uh, not much of a technological guru. I think it's probably got to set up from something. No, you're fine. You're fine. It does just look like it's your first day of school. I but see, I see tiny little squares. How I, <laughs> <laughs> this is it? <laughs> Size, can we can we help? Uh, can we help Brad at you all? You need to get closer to the camera first of all. <laughs> you need to get closer because we can't hear you that well. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Really yes. Good, we're getting really better good. now. Yeah. We're better now. Okay. There we go. All right. We're locked. I think we're good. All okay. right. Oh man. All right. Well, Brett, how's it going, oh. man? How, how how how's how you been? Man, I can't complain at all. I mean, I've been great. Uh, got through a little tweak in the knee earlier this year, and uh, yeah, you know, I feel good, man. I've been stretching a little bit the last few weeks. I'd gotten a little tight, got away from the foam roller and uh, any kind of uh, physical maintenance, you know, that you should do day to day. And I got a little tight and I'm like, well, no wonder Dommy, you got to roll around. You got to keep moving. So I've been stretching a little bit, feeling a little better. I feel fine. Thank you. Has it, has it been a, has it been a toll on, you know, you're obviously having to lug around Yuli's cart, but has it been a toll now that you're doing this series of you going out there and just getting beat up on these courses? Uh, that has been quite traumatic. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. I don't know how I keep making all these numbers. I feel like I've been programmed to make numbers. I don't know. Like Uli once said, I, I was like, this is horrible. I'm playing like a clown. He goes, dude, nobody cares <laughs> because they don't care what numbers you shoot. Just keep firing away. You know, I'm like, I, all right. So it's, it's hurt me though. I've, I've made a bunch of bad numbers and you know, that that's didn't used to be my style anyway. What's, what's been the hardest uh, hole you've played this season so far? Wow. Well, since I'm throwing it pretty much nowhere, I mean. <laughs> well, why I, is that happening? What, what happened to your distance? Well, dude, I, you know, my move is like, was always high speed, high performance, and kind of has to be worked up to a certain level to even get that adequate move to produce a, a decent shot you know it's like it takes all i got and when i don't have it completely honed i'm just you know i'm searching i'm I, I, i'm i'm dealing with scraps you know you know what i mean it's like i never get my game to the point where i've played enough to really feel like a well oiled oil machine kind gotcha. of thing. you know what yeah, i mean so you think yuli's throwing you under the bus a little bit having you come out here cold playing some of these holes <laughs> No, I mean, Nate, Nate Sexton came up with the idea when we were playing a board game in Portland, Oregon, that we <laughs> about having little pizza shops and, you know, setting up businesses and trying to take over towns and create them. And of course I wasn't very good at that either, but I did luck, <laughs> luck my way into a win one time, but they were talking about what, could, what could we do with this clown? You know? And it's like, well, you know, how about Brad versus the bruiser? Nate just pops out of the, the wild blue yonder with, you know, and it was just like, I love the sound of it right out of the gate. I thought, man, that sounds awesome. You know? And, uh, now it seems to be something that's at least rather well received, which has been shocking, overwhelming, and a lot of fun. You know, I love doing it. Even when I make big numbers as as hard as it is to swallow with your pride, I still love doing it. You know? Now you, you, uh, you've had a decent little, you know, history in disc golf yourself. So tell, tell the people a little bit about some of the accolades. Cause I'm sure all the people maybe coming up to you being like, Brad, Brad, sign, sign my disc, the bruiser, sign, you know, all these, you know, your new stardom here on Yuli's YouTube channel. But like, tell the people that maybe don't know some of your accolades that you've had, uh, in the disc golf space. Wow. Thank you for asking. You know, I do feel like that's a little swept under the rug sometimes, <laughs> but not really. You know, all the guys that are in the game, they know me, you know, know of me mostly, you know, and they're very nice to me and very uh, just incredibly kind, you know, and give me some kind words from time to time. But uh, as Paul will tell you, dude, I love nothing more than talking about disc golf and uh, sharing some of my great memories is always fun for me. So, uh, 
You know, like I was chewing this guy Camden, uh, Zach Arlinghouse's caddy. We we met him yesterday out there practicing, and uh, I let him have it pretty hard. And uh, <laughs> you know, I start just like an idiot. It's like why, like Uli says, why are you gonna make it about you, bro? It's like I feel like I'm making it too much about me, you know. But I love talking about him, so I'll get to it. Uh, my whole mission in life, once I got going with disc golf and found out that there was a tour and world championships and stuff. I tried to get it going to make it out for the, uh, I saw him leaving in 89 or no, I saw the hot stamps from the 89 world championships. This dude, like chunking a disc a certain way, a crazy way, like some type of Roman or something. I remember that. And I was thinking, man, a world championships. I want to do it. I want to be in one, you know? And, uh, Tried to get it get together in 1990, uh, and you know was not on top of the ball as much as I could have been, and it it rolled around. I didn't make it, but 91, by golly, I was like, man, I'm going. So once I got going, and uh, I had a pretty good finish. I finished uh, T12 in my first World Championships in Dayton, Ohio. Wow. And yeah, and I was in the running for rookie of the year with a, a young man named Greg Penniger from Canada. And uh, we were battling it out, come down the stretch, and I managed to edge him out by a smidgen and somehow got the rookie of the year thing. And so that was super exciting. And I was off and running, man. And uh, that, that last putt on the last hole, I'll never forget it, Brody. It was the craziest thing. I went, I set up for this putt. It was a birdie putt on like a 380 footer, which was pretty decent size hole back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I got up to putt it and it's like, dude, I just, I was frozen. Like, <laughs> you got the yips. We were just talking about the yips. Dude, it wasn't even yips. It was something other than the yips. Like, I don't know what to do with this disc in my hand. What am I doing here? I mean, it was just like, and finally it felt, this is what it felt like to me. Like I just went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get rid of it. You can throw it, do anything. You know, that. And it went in, dude. And I'll never I, Yes. Because it was such a miracle. You know what I mean? I was like, what the heck? But, uh, that's kind of how it got going for me. And, uh, when I found out about the champ, you know, and how good he was and what he was doing in the game, you know, so, uh, eventually, I don't know when it happened, but it was like, I'm, I'm, I can beat this guy. I want to be the man. I want to take down the champ. You know what I mean? Uh, I grew up playing sports and uh, baseball, and I was quite a tennis player when I got out of high school. I started playing a bit, picked up the game of golf. Uh, when I was about 26, 27 and, uh, you know, like you and like all of us, we, we just love sports, you know? And, uh, I always knew in my heart, I'm like, disc golf is a real sport, man. Disc golf is awesome. And I wanted to be a part of it. So when I met the champ, I went down to play the man in 1991 at the Zimbabwe open championship in Clearwater, Florida, Cliff Stevens park. Why Can't is it called Zimbabwe? You know, I'm not sure. I don't know, but that was allurive at the time, you know. <laughs> you thought you were actually going to Africa and you weren't? You were just going to Florida? Exactly. It, was like, it was a trick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 it might as well have been South Africa for me. <laughs> it, uh, you know, the champs land, you know, down in the, in the land of the champs. And uh, so I had this thing written in my, written down on a piece of paper. I will return home from Clearwater, Florida, having become the 1991 Zimbabwe Open champion by defeating <laughs> two-time world champion Ken Climo. Okay? And I used to say it every night before I went to bed. I mean, I was just a fanatic, you know, crazy about it. Uh, I think I'd heard about or found Tony Robbins, the uh, motivational speaker, probably not too Yeah, far I'm, I'm familiar, that. yeah. Yeah, so I was trying to use any kind of technique that I thought might help me accomplish my goal, you know. And uh, lo and behold, I got down there, and with six holes to go, I had a two-stroke lead over Ken Climo. And uh, 
I'll never forget it because Nick Sartori was he was the guy who came up with really one of the first uh, disc golf teams, Flying Eye, and uh, which I eventually uh, became a part of, you know, and I'm real proud of that. But uh, he was on one corner of the tee pad, and the champ was on the other, and we had a backup, and I had to wait. And I'll never forget it because. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the hole. I'm walking out there. I'm thinking, all right, it's like a 275 foot Anheuser mid range over a little creek. You know, you got to finish right at the end. And I'm I'm trying to size it up. And I'm taking a stable mid range. I'm gonna just power it over a little bit and let it just slowly pro fade out to the pin. I, you know, that was the shot I had played there. And uh, I turned around, and when I turned around, I saw Ken Climo. You know, just kind of. It felt like to me, like he was just like, I can't believe this little clown is. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other side of the box was Nick Sartori, who was just like, at the time, Climo's promoter, you know, totally behind the champ. And he's just, just like, just this consternation on his face, just like. <laughs> And I'll never forget it. I felt it, you know, because I'm the kind of player I like to go into a bubble and lock in, you know, and I felt the bubble dissolving <laughs> and the feel of evaporating, you know, and anyway, I step up to throw my shot. And of course I, what do I do? I decel <laughs> didn't finish the shot, you know, not, not, not in the shot till the end and it, it isers in the water, but, uh, that was a big time for me. And we come in and Steve Slazer, an excellent Florida golfer himself had gotten a hold of the Viper, which was brand new and hadn't been PDGA approved at the time, you know, and, uh, he beat us both actually, but I oh, finished wow. anyway, I was off and running. I was after the champ, you know, so that, that was anyway, it's like, I could go on and on. See, I already feel like I've been yapping too long. No, hey, that's what this podcast is all about. We don't have a length. Uh, in this podcast, so you're free to tell whatever story you want. I like that. I like a little more give and take. I just, whenever I go on and on, I just feel like you know, Yaposaurus Rex. Well, I'm sure Yuli will cut you off if you say anything too uh, too long. So I think you're oh. fine there. Um, so, yeah, uh, accolades. Uh, let me see if I can make a. Oh, yeah, quick... that was the question. What are your accolades? So far, yeah. we have you played a, a term in Zimbabwe with Ken Kleiner. <laughs> that's all. That's all we have so De- far. Decel that old seventeen and then some <laughs> yeah. other some, some other, other guy beat him. Won't be both of you. <laughs> Listen, people. If your disc golf is is silly and goofy as it sounds, just take it for what it's worth and realize that you can't slip out of the bubble, dude. <laughs> Don't let, don't let you guys on the back of the box distract you. <laughs> Locked in. Anyway, okay. Moving on. Accolades. Uh, so, you know, 1991 Rookie of the Year. Feel pretty groovy. Uh, won my first tournament. was a doubles world championship with a gentleman I had never met before named John Schiller. You met him at the tournament? I drove into the park and I saw him putting, practicing putting. And I had my girlfriend with me and I pulled in and I go, Alexia, roll down the window. And she rolled down the window and I waited till he putted and he made it. And I go, cha-ching. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy and looks at me and goes. <laughs> started practicing putting. Anyway, his name was John Schiller from Colorado and we started talking before he was about to practice the so course. That was your first time meeting him is yelling at him. Cha-ching. <laughs> Cha-ching. That's the first thing he ever heard. From and then me. he didn't respond. And then you proceeded to ask him to play doubles with you. Well, he didn't verbally respond. He, he turned towards. <laughs> what kind of thought you were crazy. Yeah. Oh, here's another disc golf lunatic. You know, who's this guy screaming cha-ching at me? I, I guess is what he was thinking. I don't know. I, that's what it seemed like. Like who's this crazy person yelling cha-ching at me? So uh, anyway, he turned out to be a super nice guy. And uh, he goes, hey, you want to play for something? And I go, sure. I love a money game. What do you want to play for a 10 or 20 or something? <laughs> and he goes, let's just play for a milkshake. I go, Love milkshakes. Sounds good. 
do it. <laughs> Huge milkshake guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, love milkshakes. Had one like two nights ago. <laughs> AP and them, and they were all going to the stakeout. And I go, please get me a cherry vanilla milkshake, hand it paid up front. They forgot it. So I got back. <laughs> yeah. So I sat there. You know how when you get it in your mind, like you really want something, and then you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so I got there for 20 minutes and then I drove up to the store and got the way I make my favorite milkshake is to just buy a quality chunk of ice cream. Oh, you're out. making your own milkshake. He does. Yes. He likes the milkshake. Brad, Brad, back, back to the guy. You <laughs> cha-ching him. Not sure. cha him. We're playing yeah. for a sh- I beat by one shot. I think I shot a nine under. We played the course blind. You know, we just went. One shot right out of the gate. Let's go. And uh, I beat him by a shot. And we start talking. He go- he goes, he goes, hey, man, do you have a doubles partner? And my uh, potential doubles, doubles partner was uh, my very good friend and a guy who was a big inspiration and uh, kept me playing disc golf uh, in my early days when I might have moved on. You know, at first, maybe I didn't see the intrinsic value of it and didn't really lock on to it the way you do when you really get locked in on it. But, uh, he, uh, was my potential partner and he, he was like kind of hemming and hawing, you know, like, yeah, well, we'll probably play. I mean, I don't know. I might know that. So I said, Hey, my, my partner's a little indecisive to be honest with you. I mean, I could probably ask him. And he might- I mean, he's my inspiration, but, uh, he's out at this point. <laughs> I saw you pop, brother. You're <laughs> in. I just, I just met a guy and we had a little milkshake battle. And now he's saying, Hey, my guy's hemming and hawing. And I said, Well, my guy hemming and hawing. So I go, Let's make the phone calls. And uh, we did. And uh, he was like, Yeah, go ahead, play with you. Uh, what do I care? You know, he, he, <laughs> he wasn't that enthused about doubles anyway for some reason. I don't really know why. And so we ended up pairing up. And, uh, yeah, that was my first win. Another crazy thing. It's like every, every story I have, that's what I mean. I can just go off these memories pop back in. And I remember I threw it into the ground, never done it before in my entire life. I get the tee up straight into the ground off the tee. He comes up with a clutch drive, carries us on that hole. And, uh, I don't know if it was the exact next hole. It might have been one or two later. Instant replay. I throw it straight into the ground. Oh, no. You're blundering. Yeah. Never. Had- so, so you're throwing it in the ground. You're freezing up. <laughs> dude, I, I, yeah. Yeah, exactly, dude. Freezing up in the last part of the, the world championships and uh, getting a T12 and then uh, throwing it in the ground. My guy's carrying me like a bag of, of uh, you know, bricks and, uh, but then afterwards, after I burned a couple in the ground, I was able to shake out of it. And I actually came up big down the stretch. I remember he threw some air and tee shots and I was there. It was like, boom, boom. And I was like, okay, we got it going now. You know, we're going, we're going. This is good. So, uh, yeah. And uh, actually to wrap it up, the, the last hole was in uh, River Bends, Michigan. And it was this super elevated tee pad. You throw downhill along the tree line on the left side, fair amount of room out on the right, but then it ducks around the corner hard to the left. It's like tucked in there like 90 feet or something. And uh, I'll never forget it. I threw my orange Viper metalhead and just peeled it right down that left side line. And then it started the super pro slow t- fade, you know, overstable doggy just ripped around the corner perfect we get down there we got like 35 feet and i remember wanting to go up there and get it and schiller goes here he goes i got this i got this one bro he goes i got it he like called me off when i was like like a rabid dog going to the lie you know i remember (laughs) (laughs) like oh i got this i got this and he popped it in there and we won and that was my first victory uh what's the world championship how goofy is that did you and this guy become like best friends not at all. <laughs> just strangers in the night. <laughs> Exchanging birdie. Yeah, never saw him again. Never, never, I don't even know where Never talk to him again. <laughs> no, um, okay, so, so that was your first win. Uh, let's go through the world titles that you have. <laughs> 
<laughs> How many are we talking about here? Buddy, you want to go uh, you want to go through world titles that I have or do you want to go through the absolute uh, heartbreakers that that would give could. us one heartbreaker your biggest heartbreak and then remember the question was what accolades do you have so that, that could be quick <laughs> <laughs> okay oh yeah 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 my bad my bad my bad <laughs> okay accolades uh five time masters champ that's what i'm talking there about there you go there we go that's that's probably the biggest for me and you know it's kind of bittersweet because it was never my idea. And, uh, one of my homies back home said, Hey, Brett, you know, you turned 40 this year, right? I go, yeah. He goes, you know, you could go play masters at the world championships and probably have a real good chance. And you get, you get your world title and then you could go try and get the open world title. And I go, I will never play masters in my entire life. <laughs> You're out of your mind, bro. You know, masters just seem like being sentenced to an island by yourself for for eternity. I was like, I'm never playing masters. What do you mean? I, I can beat anybody. That was my mindset. I, why would I play masters when I can beat anybody? You know, are you crazy? And then as the the time went on that year, whatever you know, life throws you this and that and the other, and. uh it started looking kind of good. I was like, hey, wait a minute. That kind of makes sense. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm probably uh, a good chance at a win at the Masters. So it, it kind of, you know, it kind of grabbed me by the foot a little bit. And uh, anyway, I ended up going that way. And uh, that's a story in and of itself. You know, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. And uh I think I had some car troubles and I needed to find a ride to get out there. And uh, a good friend of mine, Dave Hall from Augusta, Georgia, who I actually moved to Augusta with to play disc golf and maybe do some stuff down there initially in the early nineties. We were roommates at the time. We both caddied at the golf club of Georgia. So we had a little caddy shack with like three or four of us in there. And uh, he's like, Hey, sir, you can take, you take that Nissan, just take it. He goes, the AC doesn't work, but take it. I don't care. It'll make it, you know? And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. So that's kind of, you know, I was kind of in a little bit of a tight spot, you would say. And, uh, that kind of led me into the master thing too. You know, the lure, the ca- the carrot dang, like 35 on for first boy. <laughs> 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 and I started thinking, yeah, I could win a master's title and then I could go try to get an open title. Yeah, let's do that, you know? And, uh, yeah, uh, it didn't go that way, but, uh, <laughs> what happened was, uh, <laughs> so the AC didn't work, right? So it's hotter than how it, long are you driving here with no AC? I went from, uh, Alpharetta, Georgia to Sand Bass Park in Houston, Texas. Oh my gosh. Pack a lunch. Wait, in what month? <laughs> what what time of year? Uh the world championships was usually in the heat of the oh buddy. It was hotter than oh pavement, you know. Yeah. Good thing you won. That would have been dreadful. Yeah, but here's the twist. That's why, like I tell you, when I go to that's why it takes me so long because I think I have a photographic memory. It's never been, you know, confirmed or denied, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) so these little fragments will pop up to my journey, you know, and uh, one of them was the AC didn't work. So I went ahead and said, ACDC, baby, hell's bells. Let's go. So I cranked up the windows, turned the heat on and kept a gallon of water next to me. But you want to be like an F1 driver? Dude, I, I was just like, dude, it's going to be hot in Texas. I oh, wanna, you were preparing yourself. Was preparing. I want to <laughs> prep for this heat. Okay? And it, it turned out to be rather ingenious, actually, I think. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah. You're lucky you didn't pass out. Dude, it was amazing. I mean, I was sweating bullets, you know what I mean? Chugging water, and every now and then I'd crack a window and get a little air, but I, you know, <laughs> I went through this ritual for a lot of that ride. And uh, when I got there, buddy, it was so hot. So hot, Brody. Uh, 
I'll never forget it. I would throw a shot, reach down into my cart that I'd put together with an old golf cart and somehow fasten these two square boxes to it because I was like, I, there's a, those are flat courses. I'm not going to be schlepping my bag around out there, you know, in the heat. Yeah. And uh, I had this guy in the water and I would throw a shot, grab that thing and just be like, choke, 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 choke. So hot, dude. But uh, yeah, I'll never forget that. I, uh, I found myself, you know how, if you feel like you're, you're the horse to beat, uh, you can let it go to your head a little bit and kind of mm-hmm. put this little unnecessary internal pressure on yourself. Like, Oh man, I am the guy to beat. Oh, well, I have to win, you know, yeah. oh, don't drop the ball dummy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> all those, <laughs> all those, uh, mental spirals that we're all subject to and should avoid at all costs. But, uh, I, uh, it was, it was just super, oh yeah, I got there and I was behind the eight ball. I, I started off, you know, weak sauce. I, I had nothing. I was not making any birdies. I was choking, missing putts, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I believe it was Dean Tanner that was, uh, I think, eight shots ahead of me after two rounds. And he had me by eight shots. And that next round is when I threw it into gear, man. I was just like... I mean, I found what worked for me, you know, which is, it, it's, it's a place and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mindset and it's a feeling that I wish I could recreate, uh, every day at a moment's notice, you know, it's, it's something that you can search for and find occasionally and hopefully more often than not. But, uh, man, I'll just never forget it. I, it was like, I couldn't hear anything. I was just, uh, grabbing the grass Feeling the wind, thinking about that golf shot. You're dehydrated. That's what. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 literally delirious. <laughs> yeah, you're delirious. You're you're done. This is, you're having a heat stroke. <laughs> yeah, I'm delayed heat stroke. Stroke. You're <laughs> holding grass up to your ear, trying to listen to it. <laughs> hey, Brody, you don't know how accurate that is. I mean, that's basically what was going on. I mean. I, like I say, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know how you tap into it, but I've done it, you know, uh, quite a few times, but you remember it more times than, or less times than others. But like, uh, I remember it there. I remember it when I played on a blown groin in 2007 and reeled off six unanswered birdies when I was down eight shots on a blown groin that I'd played on all week that I blew out on the first day of the world championships in 2007. And I already had a little bit of a lead. There was like three holes left into the the second round of the first day. I was torn between playing in the open championship and, or the masters there. I was on that, that razor's edge because, uh, man, I was playing so good, dude. I mean, I just remember, I was like, Brad, you're an idiot. If you play masters, how can you play masters now? You're playing the best golf of your life. What are you thinking about? But I had won the year before in 2006, which was four out of five. So I had this, you know, my head was all messed up and I, anyway, but, uh, I went to that place, man. And, and it's, it, it's the zone. It, you found the zone. You found the Brad zone. Dude, the Brad zone is there somewhere. And and then when I find it, man, I find it some of the sweetest, sweetest action on the planet that you can. When's the last time you've been to the Brad zone? Yeah. Oh my God. I couldn't tell you. Has it been this year? Have you found the Brad (laughs) zone this year? Finish his accolades for the people at home (laughs) real quick. He has, he has five masters world titles, two doubles world titles. I just looked at his statistic he has 27 national tour victories in the masters division and one in the open. So he's got it done. He has 126 wins, I think. Jeez. That's, so that's- he's got, he's got enough accolades to go around. That's <laughs> for sure. Never got the big one guys. That's it. I missed the big ones. I didn't get the USGGC and I didn't get the open. Like I wanted plenty of top tens. Give, give us did you were you ever close to the world championships? Did you ever have a good shot at winning the in the open? Oh, buddy, I had a five stroke lead in 1996. I I shot a course record at George Wilson Park 
that was when I was going. My little mantra was cool, calm, collected, perfection, rifle this disc in the proper direction. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that before I put that on a shirt, Silas. Yeah, like That's that. electric. <laughs> I tell you, dude, it's one of the, yeah, there, it's like Tony Robbins, you know, it's like the mind, the mind game, like Jack said, it's that six inch strip of fairway that makes most of the difference. Once you attain the skill set to your greatest ability, then it comes down to what you do with your mind. I feel like that, that, that is the, uh, the major determining denominator for success. <laughs> All right, so you so you win all these tournaments. Where'd you go? You know, you leave the tour for a while. You 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 get the Masters titles, and then yeah. you left the game for a while. What happened then? You know, I it kind of that's a soft spot for me, and I, I'm embarrassed to it to to tell you the truth a little bit, but because uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a big dog uh, big dose of weak sauce, kind of. <laughs> Kind of a big dose a week. I mean, depending on how you look at it, you know, I had spent so many years dedicating my life to being the the greatest disc golfer that I could be uh, with uh, ebbs and flows of full commitment during that span, as one might imagine, you know, you, you give something you're all, you, you're all for, and then you, you lose focus and you, you have lapses and you, you maybe not, not as uh driven as you could have been uh but uh yeah uh you know with in in the sport of disc golf as you can imagine a self-governed sport uh back in the day and that's one thing i love so much about being out there on the pro tour i just love the fact of the way pretty much all of the guys i've seen out there You know, we all are subject to lose our cool a little in one way or another. Sure, it's golf. It feeds you your launch. You're going to get punched in the face. You're going to have to deal with it out there. It's not always easy. Like Roberto DiVincenzo said when when he chopped it up at the Masters, sometimes it's not so easy. (laughs) You know, but... uh, What happened to me was, I I guess I kind of took the opinion of, man... I'm the five-time Masters world champ. I'm defending my title. And I had to deal with the same kind of stuff that a professional golfer deals with in a self-governed environment for 20-something years. And, uh, you know, I think the the way I applied myself to the game might have been slightly ahead of its time as far as acceptance is concerned. I think uh, I would be much more accepted if I were myself then today, like trying to be a pro out on the pro tour. But back then, you know, uh, I always wanted it to be a professional sport. I always wanted to act like a professional, play in a professional environment. And I'm kind of a purist, an old schooler, you know. And so I like it to be quiet and I don't want to be distracted when I'm making my effort. And I try to always provide that etiquette for every other player as well. You know, I felt that to the degree that you can exude good etiquette, it should come back. You know, it should be uh, circular. It should be like, you know, the infinity sign. So it's like karma. You know, if, if you're always putting out there, hey, buddy, I want you to do your best. The last thing I want to do is distract you. But a lot of the other players weren't really like that. You know, is all I can say. Uh, they didn't see things the way I saw them. And uh, I would kind of get frustrated about it and then eventually not handle it correctly and kind of lose my cool and fly off the handle about, can't you be a better professional? You know, <laughs> I, no, you know, you could ask a bunch of people and, uh, you know, there's always going to be player haters. And I was a player and uh, I think I got hated on a little bit because of my lack of professionalism in a few moments and uh, just the fact that I was such a grinder, you know, but the thing I love about now is that everyone seems to act more like a professional. They want Mm -hmm. it. You know, they're glad that they have a professional tour. They love the fact that they have a professional tour and they want to act like professionals back then. That's kind of how I wanted to be. And it just really, I don't know, maybe I was too intense 
I'm a bit of an animal when I compete, you know, I don't. <laughs> so you take the big break, you come back. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry, so, so yeah, I basically got fed up with the lack of professionalism side of it. I was like, dude, what am I doing? I've spent my whole life out here with you guys and everybody thinks I'm a clown. <laughs> Not everybody, but a lot of people, you know, Hey, hey, I was like Rodney Dangerfield. Hey, hey, I can't get any respect out here. <laughs> you know, I, I win I went seven world titles. What? You're gonna just <laughs> pick dirt up in my face? I'm trying to putt and tell me I'm a clown for getting mad, you know. But uh, you know, I and, and too, you know, you get along. I was a late bloomer. I didn't get going until I was like 26. So, you know, the old midlife crisis. Hey, you've been a clown your whole life. Maybe you can't be a clown forever. <laughs> you need to get out of the circus. Uh, you know, so it was like, yeah, I better at least try to act like a responsible human for three years, five years, you know, do something with yourself. You become a five-time world champion and apparently nobody cares, you know? <laughs> so, so it was like, all right, I've had enough, you know, hasta la vista. You know, you guys don't want a pro. Okay, fine. I'm out of here. And, and, you know, I kind of feel bad about it, you know, because obviously I love the sport. I always have, uh, you know, and, uh, it hurt not playing for a while. You know, I got it going again, 2016, 2017. I came out there and, uh, played in both world championships and played. Okay. You know, I did cash in the open division. I think AB told me I beat him there. He goes, dude, you beat me in 2017. Oh. <laughs> I was like, you're joking, right? Because I didn't even play good, you know? Well, I don't you know. might have only been seven, Brad. Yeah, so I don't know if like I would put like a, give a big like pat on your back there for being <laughs> so, a seven-year-old. So, so, Brad, you, cut, you come back. <laughs> seven feet tall, too. Though. <laughs> Take these guys through the decision to come out on, and, and jump on, on the bag. Yeah, how, what was the connection with you and Yuli? How did that, how did that happen? You know... Uh, I've never been a big church goer. <laughs> I don't know where this okay. is going, but I, I All like right. This. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Let me lead out with that. I've never been a big church goer. However, I've always felt a very strong connection to the man. Okay. I believe in the man. How could there be this incredible, glorious universe multitude of multiverses, you know, that goes on for a gazillion years, you know, and people talk about spirituality, you know, you don't have any proof I take in Jesus' stand, but I believe that uh, no matter what religion you do or do not believe in, I believe that there is a good energy in the world that wants everything to be good. Okay. I mean, he built this place or it all came together because of goodness. If you think about human nature, it is basically good. Of course, you know, it's planet Earth. There's a gazillion things that have happened and some people get off track. You know, people do bad things, you know. So. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay yeah. But, but <laughs> I believe in... In the good world, and and, and I then just, Yuli walked through the door. <laughs> God for me. That's right. I said it, folks. Uli's a god. <laughs> the god. There are many gods in the disc golf community. Oh my gosh! Out and try to meet them. They are incredible, godlike people. But uh, no. So Big Uls called me, and he throws this curveball at me, and says, "Hey, dude." I want you to come out here and caddy for me. And so, you know, you hear that. And of course, my egotistical, egocentric molecules go. <laughs> and I'm like, caddy? Dude, I used to be one of the guys. I was one of the men. And now I got to be a caddy? What? But I'm a caddy anyway, you know? I, I caddy in golf, ball golf, and I have, I did for more than 30 years. 
obviously I love the game of golf. That's another thing that Uli and I share in common, you know, but no, they say in life that, you know, you're lucky if you have two or three good friends. And, uh, so Uli, I said, dude, I got to think about this, bro. I got to think about this. one. you want me to come out there and caddy where I'm known as an absolute clown. <laughs> they tried to pin wraps. Dude, listen, we had a course back in the day. Hadn't had maintenance since it opened two years ago. Okay, limbs hanging down on baskets. Uh, try to make it. <laughs> Dude, trees in the way. Just, hey, just no, we're not getting off track. We're not getting off track. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> I can get back. Don't worry. Okay. It's, okay. it's correlated. It's correlative. Okay. Uh, Cor- correlated. Thanks for making me come up with a big word at the wrong time. <laughs> now I won't be able to remember anything. So now, Yuli calls you, says you want to, hey, can you come out here and caddy? Yeah. Right, right. Hey, dude, I want you to come out here and caddy for me. Figure it out. <laughs> I'm like, you want me to come caddy for you and figure it out? And I go, dude, I, I got to take a day or two to think about this. <laughs> Just give me a, can, can I think about it? He's like, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So I thought about it, you know, and I really didn't have to think long because in all of my travels, uh, disc golf related or any other, and I feel very fortunate to have done the travel I have, but I never met a guy I liked more than Paul Ulibarri. Okay. I just love the guy. He's like a brother I never had. So he calls me and asks me this, and I was like, this is probably the only guy I would do this for, but I'm going to do it, you know? I mean, A, it's not rocket science. If I want to go be a caddy again, I can be a caddy. So I was like, worst case scenario, Paul, if I get in a bad spot, you just help me get back to where I was, you know, before uh, I started caddying for you. And uh, it was an easy decision. I was like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. My favorite guy in the world called me up and wants me to come out and caddy for him, dude. So the more I thought about it, the more I loved it, obviously. And as soon as I did it, it, it was just the greatest thing ever. I'm like, dude, this is so awesome. I remembered how much I love the game, how much fun it is, how great the people are, uh, getting to see old friends, you know, and uh, just – it just it just seemed like God to me. It seemed like God said, hey, bro, we miss you, dude. Come on back, dude. Come back into the circle, bro. Let's play some disc golf. That's really what it felt like to me. And uh, so, yeah, it was an easy decision. And, dude, I, w- I love it. I absolutely love it. I feel like one of the luckiest guys in the world to have, a, a, a friend like Paul and uh, to have a sport like disc golf that I love, you know, and get to be a part of and get to go out there and, and enjoy and uh, hopefully make a difference, you know, and who knows how, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, but that's it. That's how it happened. One question I do want to ask is because you've been around the, the I would consider like the three big eras that we've had. Right. There was the Ken Climo era. Okay. Then you had the Paul McBeth era. Okay. And now I think we're kind of in this Gannon Burr era, right? Yeah. Sure feels that way, doesn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> what, what similar similarities have you seen through these three different eras? Like what, what, and specifically those three people, Climo, McBeth, and Gannon Burr now, what similarities do you see in their game, their personalities, since right. you've kind of been been around for all three? Yeah. Uh, well, initially, I immediately think of just intelligence. Uh, Gannon Burr, I mean, what a guy. You know what I mean? This guy's a kid. He's some kind of alien giant that just seems so <laughs> far beyond his years. Uh, emotionally intellectually just down to earth wise. He just seems like one of the greatest people you'll ever meet. I mean, Gannon Burr is awesome. He may take a little extra time out there from time. To time. <laughs> and, uh, when we played together, I thought, man, he's talking an awful lot. You know, <laughs> I might need to pull my player in over here, you know, but, uh, love the guy, uh, Paul McBeth. Are you kidding me? Look at this guy. 
he's just an animal. That's just an athlete animal that, you know, he's like built to throw, but his mind, you know, he's, he's serious when he's out there playing. And then of course the champ, I mean, come on, Cosmo. Oh my gosh. You won't find a more uh, aggressive competitor than that gentleman, but also very intelligent. Kenny is, 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 as many crazy things I could tell you about the champ and I, uh, arguing, <laughs> just acting like clowns, uh, over petty stuff. Uh, the champ is very level headed. He's, uh, very clear minded, you know, he's, and, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, Paul, I know Paul Macbeth's been, uh, going through different levels of his career. And I don't know how much he applied himself in every area. You know, I'm sure when you get busy, you might, but you see him now, you know, he's really trending. It seems like, and mm-hmm. he said his game comes in levels and he he's, uh, he's just an incredible, you know, smart tactician. I think, I think they're all good tacticians, uh, just level headed. Obviously they love the game. They live for the game. They work very hard at it. Uh, they're naturally gifted in some areas. The champ was a big dude. You know, I remember the first time I played with Kenny, I, I didn't birdie a hole for nine holes. because I was watching this guy throw. I was just like, what am I witnessing here? You know, just the action, the cleanliness, the, uh, the repetitive purity. He does. And- Climo does have this aura to him too, though. Cause when I got oh. to watch him play last year at USDGC at that skins match, uh-huh. You're, you're right. It's a, you can't really, you can't really look away. You kind of just are like locked in on like everything the guy does. Right. That's ex- I don't uh, know if it's because we've like built him up as this like mythical character. And it was my first time, <laughs> you know, getting to see him in person and, and to play disc golf. Yeah. But there, there is something about him that you, it makes you want to watch him play disc golf. Dude, no doubt. I mean, he's an athlete, bro. The champ is something else. He's uh. He's tall, he's long, he's lean, he's pretty big, dude. He's got big hands. You know, I mean, he's an athlete, dude. He's a good golfer. And uh just uh yeah. I mean, the guy rarely missed shots, you know. I, I they make fun of us all the time. Like Kenny and I were throwing paper plates with staples around the rim <laughs> on, on fifty foot holes and <laughs> this golf is a, is a, a completely different realm now than it ever was. Like all he had to be was a plumber and some guy wearing a tie dye shirt. And, (laughs) but I'm telling you there, I've, I've seen disc golf for a long time now. And I think I know greatness and, uh, you put a healthy champ in there right now, dude, he's going to be brewing action and kicking people's ass and winning tournaments. I think he he shot like five under through the first, they played that little loop at the, during the skins thing. And I think he was like five under through seven. There you, oh yeah, I just which, talked. To him. Which Dang. is like very good. <laughs> like he, he yeah. would he would be in the lead after it, probably seven holes. And listen, this is a minimized champ too. Now the champ's no spring chicken. He's only five years behind myself, and the champ's high mileage damaged goods as well. Maybe not as damaged goods as me. I've been in multiple car accidents. I tried to jump in a car rolling backwards down a hill when I was younger. I mean, I, dude, I, yeah, but the champ. <laughs> He, that's why throw he that to, one in there. Okay. <laughs> the champ had to step away from the game because, uh, sadly after he would compete, you know, he would experience a lot of pain, but, uh, uh, he told me, I talked to him just the other day. He was supposed to come up and do commentary this week before this hurricane Milton started barreling down his throat, which I'm worried to death about. Adam Hammer says it's the worst hurricane in the history of the world. And it's going right at Tampa. So I'm a little concerned for the champ right now, but, uh, yeah. Uh, you're talking to him. Oh yeah. Yeah. My bad. My bad. And, uh, he said, yeah, dude, I played the other day. He goes, dude, I shot a a 42 or something. He said, I didn't, I didn't play the gold tees. He was talking about Cliff Stevens. He's like, I played the normal long course and I shot like, 42, 12 under, or, uh, it might've been better than that. I don't remember the number, but it was very, very low. 
And I was like, geez, champ. And I, I was like, did you feel okay after that? He goes, he goes, yes, surprisingly, uh, I'm not getting as much pain as I was before. And he plays golf now and doesn't get as much pain. So that's, that's really good to hear. But, uh, do you think we could ever see him play again at like a USDGC? You know, we're seeing Nate Doss kind of make a little bit of a comeback in the sense of like he got to play out at a uh, Beaver state fling earlier this year. And now he's coming out after, I believe seven years of not playing at USDGC. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's so awesome. And, and Nate looked pretty darn solid today. It was course, crisp. The, the rusty mistakes, you know, because other than the first round, Yuli at Beaver state, he played great. Yep. He kind yeah. of put, he kind of put himself in a hole that he couldn't really get out of, but his uh-huh. last couple of rounds were great. Yeah. Yeah. Watching him throw today. He's got a good move, man. He's still, he can pop it out there adequately fine, you know, and he's incredibly accurate and his putting stroke is so simple and effective. You know, I see Nate having a good week here. I really do. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you think, do you think Kenny will ever play again? You think? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pray that he would, you know, he, he's really gotten into this family mode the last few years. You know, he had his last daughter, I think she's 13 now or something or 14 or 15, something like that. It's happened so fast. But, uh, you know, a lot of times when I ask the champ about doing this, that, or the other, he's always like, dude, I got my family, bro. Mm. And I'm like, get it i understand you know you can't ever argue that family comes first so uh you know but the champ i don't know how many years he's got left but i'd I'd love to see him lean that way for sure and uh i'll ask him about it next time i see him yeah that'd be crazy crazy to see him play in person that that would definitely be must see tv for sure right Um, you know i would love to do something with the champ where like him and i could play doubles against a couple of guys dude that would make my day I'll, I'll get your I'll, I'll get your old doubles partner. It'll be me and him versus you two. <laughs> cha-ching. I'll get cha-ching. <laughs> yeah. I'll get him on the line. You got it. You got it. Oh, quick, quick. You got another memory from me. Here we go. All I wanted to do was play doubles with the champ at the world's one. You pounded him. Champ, let's play. Champ, champ, champ. Doubles, doubles. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Forever. No. Not going to do it. Finally, after Kevin McCoy and I won... In uh, 2004, I said, so, Kevin, we running this back that day. Kevin, we running this back. Uh, no, I got me a new partner for next year, which was just like a hockey stick to the chin for me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> ever forget that. I'm like, we just won 30 minutes ago. <laughs> You're already dumping me? me. That to me made no sense until I found out he Coda Hatfield. Johnny gunslinger extraordinaire. Boom. So finally I get the champ to agree. All right, bug. All right. We'll play some doubles. Let's do it. Dude. The champ and I went double yellow band 25 times in the tour. <laughs> Wait, what is that? What's double yellow band? High, high yeah. on the basket. It's doubles, doubles partner. You make a beautiful looking putt. That's in for sure. No. Bang, ah, the- <laughs> okay. I got you. I got it. Oh, identical twin bang, on the ground. You guys I'm, couldn't I'm- make any putts. Huh? You couldn't make any putts. Dude, we lost by like two shots. We double yellow banded 70,000 times. <laughs> like. Minimum of 15 to 20. Honest to God. I wish I. <laughs> it's one of those. Never before, never after. Never seen anything like it. Never seen these guys do it. You guys are never going to do it. I know these guys won't do it, probably. <laughs> if anyone else has had a yellow band syndrome like the champ and I have, I want to hear about it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We both, we hit, we had like a 90-footer. Bang, <laughs> bang. <laughs> On the ground, dude. I, I was crying. I was like, I got champ after 15 years of begging him to be my partner and we go <laughs> you know band on the run it was horrible i think i know the answer did you guys play doubles together the next year never again <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. oh yeah. all right i'm gonna change it up a little bit i got a question for you not including professional players okay not including people that are currently on tour where do you see yourself ending in a caddy tournament 
So all the caddies that you've seen out there now, I'm not, again, this is not like when James Proctor caddies for Evelina. This is not yeah. when, uh, you know, other players caddy for Gannon. I think we've seen like, you know, Gannon or Ga- there's other pros out there that caddy for one another. Sure. 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 Uh, yeah. I know. Well, remove all those. I'm talking about the legitimate caddies only. Gotcha. Where do you see yourself playing a caddy only tournament? Uh, well, you know, I don't know how much uh, I know about all the other caddies games, except for like Jeff Brick. I know Jeff Brick's pretty solid. He caddies for Simon and, you know, maybe some other folks. So usually what about just, Isaac's dad? Huh? Isaac's I, dad. Yeah. Uh, I've ran into Mike uh, a few times at, back home in Atlanta at uh, uh, a disc golf course. Uh, but I really haven't spent much time, but I'm, I'm sure. I mean, look. You got Ez and, and uh, Isaac as kids. You're obviously got something going on. Yeah. With, with some kind of game. I know he likes to do running rounds. He'd probably run me down if we played a running round. That's probably. Oh, jeez. Yeah, he, that's his thing. I think they all used to do it. I think the Robinson family, I actually saw part of the Robinson family uh, one time out there at uh, at the same park. I can't think of the name of it right now, but. Uh, so they like to run. He he might wear me out, you know. But here's the thing, Brody. It's like my game, I play a, a little bit, then I don't play, then I play a little bit. We do a bruiser, yada, yada, yada. I butcher the bruiser. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like when you're as old and little as I am and your move is about speed and explosion, it's – uh. It's it, if I had more time to uh, regenerate my – set to a little higher level i could be more effective than i am currently but uh at right now i'm actually i feel pretty good and i've i mean ask paul i was i uh out of the car under par here at usdgc uh both times uh played hole one uh, i butchered a couple of holes but i would have shot decent few over even with the butcherage and uh <laughs> but i feel like i could shoot under par at usdgc right now but that that brody is with this minimize skill set that I have carry with me presently, you know? Well, let's talk about that move and the explosion. Um, the first time I ever saw you throw a disc, I didn't know what mm-hmm. I was looking at. Right. I thought, I thought you were about to throw it in the opposite direction. Sure. Well, explain to the people how you came about this very unique, uh, Both setup. the drive and the putt. Yeah. The drive <laughs> and the putt. Sure. Yeah. Well, there are two different stories. And, uh, the first one is, uh, with the drive, uh, I was trying to hit this 325 foot number one out at Rico in Georgia, a wooded downhill hole, 325. So the effective width of the fairway was probably 20 feet, 25. I don't know, but it's pretty tight, you know? And, uh, this is early in my days and, I just kept spraying them. I couldn't, I couldn't hit this fairway and, uh, out of, uh, necessity being the mother of invention or frustration or a little of both or, uh, just natural athletic ability, <laughs> which I, uh, have a little bit of, I, uh, I just turned around. I was like, what the heck dude? And I just turned around backwards, ran backwards, ripped the shot and hit the flagpole on top of the basket. And I was like, bing, you know, so it just happened. I, I, and I was like, what the heck just happened there? And I, I tried it again and I hit the fairway again and I'm kind of off and running from there. And, uh, I feel that that's probably largely in part that I'm, uh, well, no, that's not really, I, I mean, I feel like I go after distance that way because being a little guy with a quick move and not much range of motion, I have to generate enough speed and then momentum thrown into the shot, kind of like a crow's hop in baseball. Yep. You know, when you scoop that puppy up and you throw your upper body at it, Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Dickerson reminds me a lot of, uh, how my upper body action used to be a little bit. I see him, he kind of throws his upper body at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but yeah, just, I started throwing like that and getting some success with it. And, uh, that's how the, uh, turnaround move came about. I was like, dude, if I just turn around and uh, then from there, I figured out how to get set up perfectly. Uh, I look at it like a, like 
on the the right leg being uh, the uh, the cylinder, and your your arms and your torso are on that cylinder, and you have to spin the cylinder as far as you can, and then pop it at the target. You know. Okay. So if you get the cylinder wrapped up tight, the gun loaded and wrapped up off the right hip. You know, and it's a fine line because I kind of injured my knee when I tried. To- <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I think I got the dude. You were, you used to wrap tight on your hip, wrap tight. And I started turning shot after shot. They were little 320 footers. And the next thing I was throwing a 200 footer and she went, oh, let's stab the guy in the knee with an ice pick. What? <laughs> You know, so that's where the knee injury came from. But uh, no, it, so it it you it it's it's something you got to feel yourself. But you 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 get you get it locked in. It's basically taking all of the slack out of the rope, right? Okay. So you take the slack out, you throw it. There's not going to be all this fluctuation. It's going to come clean out of there because the gun's loaded here, <laughs> wrapped down to the hip, on the knee. You know what I mean? And so that's, I don't know. I'm an idiot savant. As, as, as hey, a- it, it, whatever works. At the end of the day, it's, you got to do what Listen, works. Listen, you're for not going to you. find shoot. somebody hit more gaps than this guy. Shooters got to shoot. Fairway right down the middle. All right, go into the putt. I need another. I yeah, need, okay. Explain <laughs> the putt now. Because the putt, the putt is just as unique. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank Paul. you. I want to, <laughs> I want to thank Paul for not mentioning the fact that although it goes right down the middle, it goes about two forty. <laughs> <laughs> you're basically you're basically doing like a That's Gannon Bird true. jump putt is what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Like AB can outdrive me with a mini. At least he keeps it. <laughs> no, but uh, I, actually, you know, it all depends because I. Like I say, I'm high mileage damage goods, uh, buddy. I've been through the ringer. I mean, if you want, I mean, I, 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 I'm an active guy, and I have been an active guy for a thousand years. So, uh, all right, putt. Tell us again, about the putt. With, with each passing year, it's like, hey, wait a minute, dude. Uh, yeah, you're season up, bro. You better stay on top of this because uh, you don't want to seize up. So. <laughs> Like I say, I started stretching. I'm on this. Well, I'm a call. I, 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 I almost got on it last year. I call it last chance badass. Okay. When you get to be my age, uh, I used to consider myself a badass, Brody, basically is, is what. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, dude, listen, I may be a little guy, but I'm pretty freaking tough. You know what I mean? So gymnast in high school bouncing around like a super ball you know what i mean baseball since i was four double a tennis player let's go buddy rip that golf ball you know what i'm saying <laughs> so uh the body's in rough shape talk about the putt where'd the putt come from okay it was either 2003 or four i was in albuquerque new mexico out there on tour and uh 50 mile an hour wind I'm like, holy moly, I got to get this action. Bro. There's a 50 mile an hour wind out there. So I found the nearest disc golf course and I found the angle to go straight into the 50 mile an hour monster. Right. So, of course, everything. <laughs> nothing looking like it was thinking about going in. Right. So here again, necessity is the mother of invention. It was necessary for me to get as tight as I could. So I started <laughs> wrapping up. Same principle, it's the same exact principle. You can coil your body to the left. Can't see you that well. Okay. You can coil your body to the left and hold it and lock it in. You know what I mean? And get locked. Okay. Locked position. That's pretty much the athletic position, you know right arm kind of up against the chest. Like if you had a tennis racket, you'd be holding that puppy strong there and then ripping on it like that. If you're hitting a baseball, you're kind of locked in right there. It's all about being locked in and taking all the slack out of the move is kind of the, uh, the idea behind it. Okay. 
Yeah, the, yeah, the concept, I guess you would say. And listen, I'm not the brightest light in the tree. Anybody will tell you that. I've been dropped on my head from, from a rope. <laughs> <thing. laughs> okay, I've been multiple car accidents. I mean, okay, Brad, Brad. So, so you lock it up. The point, no, the point, it's relevant because okay. you don't need genius to do what I'm talking about. It's the point I'm trying to make. You just have to feel it. I'm a feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. A Tiger Woods, feel, baby. I'm the same way. I'm a Capricorn, just like Tiger. I'm 13 years older than Tiger. And by golly, you know, I was always a huge Tiger fan. And it's basically because I share an affinity with the man. It's as far as the way I play disc golf is, is the way I feel like Tiger plays ball golf. So that's kind of where I ran into all the rough spots back in the day. It's like, who's this little numbskull that's acting like Tiger Woods? <laughs> We're all out here having a good time. You know? Hopefully it was just the on-course stuff that you're acting like Tiger Woods and not off the course stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. it was for the most part. But, you know, like I say, <laughs> dude, listen. If right, you, Brad, the putt, the putt. The putt. So, yeah, so I'm winding up like a top, and I'm springing it into the headwind, you know, for about three or four hours. I don't know, two to four hours. And uh, eventually I started getting a tighter line. Ding, ding, hitting some metal. Ding, ding, getting closer. You know, I don't remember if I made any. I feel like I probably made one or something, but I don't really remember that. I just remember that after that, I went to my next tournament and I started implementing that. Uh, and dude, I was putting like a god. <laughs> I mean, buddy, I was making it was like I, I had gotten better. I really had, you know, leveled up a little bit with the flat stick, and uh, I loved it. You know, so it, it's it's a very physical thing. It's like you wrap up. It's like my whole disc golf game is so, uh, and I, and I recognize this in a lot of other players. I see similarities with their footwork and stuff. I, I can tell when they're on their toes, you know what I mean? And, and just using your energy absolutely all the way from your toes up to, to your hand when you throw it, you know, and that's kind of what I am a field player. You know, you get locked in the right spot, get the touch, right. If you get the right combo with everything, then, as long as you make a pretty aggressive action, you know, it can only go so wrong. It's kind do, you, of do you see any of these people that are like struggling with putting? Do you, maybe they could go the Brad method. Do dude, you see look, that could happen? Dude, I, I doubt it will. But what I do know is that, and I love doing this and I always uh, tell everybody about it, you know, dude, just talk to a pro, go talk shop with a, with a top pro. Just, just go, Hey, what are you doing, bro? Cause that was, that was one thing I felt like was uh, one of my uh, strengths is I was not afraid. You know, I asked the champ uh, back in my early day, I was asked Jim, uh, Jim Akins was uh, a really good golfer that I played with a lot when I was, I was like, Jim, how did you do that? You know, when you're first into the game and you see people throw these, like, dude, I got to do what share, share it with me, dude. What's going on? How do I do that? You know, you're, you're really mind blown and uh, just talk shop with people because you're always going to make uh, your stroke is always going to be your own. It's going to be an expression of yourself, but it doesn't hurt to think about every other aspect that other people use because you might find the one that just clicks for you, you know? If, if we see some of these players show up next year, Yuli, and they're coiling up, and they're wrapping up, to the man. Basket, I will, I will lose my mind. Dude, it's not going to happen. But you know, now that you've said that, I am going to make it my mission to find some kid out there that'll adopt that style and take it to the top. There's a bunch of people. I'm telling you, Brad, there's a bunch of people on tour that they're looking for something. I mean, the fact that you're taught, you're, 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 uh, what is this called again? Um, what is that called? What? When you throw like this. Turbo. Yeah. Turbo. The fact that people are trying to turbo putt from oh, yeah. five feet because they, they can't trust their normal putt. Why Dude. not do the coil? Why not? Oh, Brody, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I don't know what happens to guys when they think they got to do that from that close. I mean, we got a problem there. Yeah. That's unbelievable. I know. I see, I see people. But, no, back to what you were saying, I, you know, when I'm out there watching all these pros play when I'm with Big Ools, uh, you know, I love watching them and studying them and seeing how they're doing their stuff and all that. And uh, I've seen things, and I've, I've even mentioned to a couple of people, I forget who it was exactly, like Randon Lotta, I saw him, uh, talked to him in Boston the other day at uh, Casey White's house, actually. We went out there, and uh, 
we were talking about his play and, and I said, dude, listen, if you ever just want to talk shop, I mean, just say, Hey, Brad, what, what do you do? You know what? And what, I, what I'm getting at is that I feel like I do have something to offer. I mean, I'm a good athlete. I mean, God didn't give me everything, but he gave me an athletic ability. Uh, and I feel like I'm a good people person and I can, uh, convey certain things to people, uh, you know, like a coach. I feel like I'm very coachable and I'm a decent coach too. Does Yuli want you to be coaching up his competition? You know, there's another aspect of it too. You know, I don't, I don't know that I really want to help on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, it amazes me because I was always so avidly pursuing good players to share with me what they yeah. knew. Yeah. It, 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 it's kind of, it strikes me as odd. I guess I should say that if, if someone was struggling and I said to him, Hey man, you know, I got some game, you know, bro, if you ever want to talk shop, let's go. And I've said it to probably a few, you know, and I haven't got much response. So <laughs> well, maybe after this podcast, you'll get more. One of my favorite tailor made videos and you'll like this Brad being a tiger fan is that yeah. they've got literally all the top guys, right? All the top guys are there. Tiger's there as well. I mean, I'm talking Rory. I'm talking um, uh, Jason Day. I mean, just the whole list of all the top. Ta- I think uh, this was back when it was. Um, uh, who's the guy that just went to uh, live? D- Johnson. Um, Dustin. Dustin Johnson. I'm, I'm talking the big, big names, right? And, right. DJ. And Yeah, they're all out there. They're all hitting balls and stuff like that. They're all talking, saying stuff. And then all of a sudden, like, Jason asked Tiger a question about something. And Tiger starts to talk. Uh Everyone goes silent. And everyone Uh listens. And it was the only time that everyone, like, stopped their little side convos. And right. everyone was just like trying to listen to see what Tiger had to say to <laughs> yeah. try to get any ounce. And I think right. you're right. I think that is a huge thing. I mean, my first year playing ultimate Frisbee, I uh-huh. seeked out our top two guys on the team and yeah. I, I probably annoyed the crap out of them because I asked them endless amount of questions and yeah, that's I think that's what you gotta do. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that's what you got to do. You got to ask people that are better than you what they're ask doing. And hopefully, hopefully they're dumb enough to give you the answers. <laughs> right. Or, or they don't even care. They're just like, yeah, I'll, dude, come and get it. Yeah, Here's a- true. See yeah. if you can do it. You know, that's the way I look at it. You know, uh, other than uh, improving players to beat my guy, I certainly don't want that. But I do want to help any disc offer I can at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I like it. <laughs> being the, having the athletic background that I have and, uh, love for sports and just, I've been around sports my whole life. And, you know, I don't know what these guys need for accolades. You know, it's like you say, I mean, the way I look at the game is that I never got the USCGC and I never got the world championship in the open division. Other than that, I pretty much, you know, checked all the boxes. Well, some of the best coaches in other sports have zero accolades as far as their individual goes compared to pros. Right. But, you know, maybe, I don't know. I I think, I think, I think you have a wealth of knowledge um, that a lot of youngsters for sure uh, could definitely use. And like I said, maybe, maybe someone will listen to this podcast and maybe you'll have more people reaching out to you. Man, I mean, that would be totally cool with me. I'd, I'd love to work with anyone, but you know, it, it always, here's the thing. It's like, we all, or not we all, but we as coaches and players that want to help other people like Uli and Simon with their Institute, uh, there's, there's all these different approaches. So it's like, just check them out. Like you could check me out. I might not do anything for your game at all, yeah. but you might find something that was like, Hey, you know, numbskull told me to do this and by golly, you know, it, it worked. Yeah. I can't believe it, you know? So no, but I do feel like I have a decent amount of knowledge, but then on the other hand, I'm kind of an idiot savant too, you know? So <laughs> I don't know if, I, if, uh, if I'm as intelligent as I think. <laughs> Listen, I, it, no, Brad, one of my be- favorite things about Brad, um, the last couple of years, 
before this last season, I was struggling, man. I was taking like 70th and I wasn't cash. I had like nine straight missed caches through that whole process. You know, I'm down on myself and like, I don't believe in myself and I, I know it's there and I'm trying and I, I don't like to listen to a lot of stuff, but through that whole process, this guy's on my bag with a life that he can go back to caddying. Right. And I, uh, and I, uh, the constant Paul, you're the greatest Paul. You're the greatest Paul. Don't say that you're the greatest Paul. No. And he's having to deal with me missing cashes. I don't make money. He's not making that extra money. And it would, there's never been one time that this guy didn't pump me up. You know what I mean? And that was so important because then when it started clicking, this is the guy that I need, you know, mm. with there, because if he's, if this guy believes in me to that extent, what am I doing with myself? You know what I mean? And, uh, I think that's what he takes to, to everything that Brad does. I mean, he does it a hundred percent and I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Man. Thanks Paul. Yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to interrupt him before that because he said, what did he say? I don't like to listen to much. I mean, that's not true. He doesn't hear a word I say. <laughs> no, not only does he not hear it, he refuses to open his ears to try to hear it. <laughs> There's really no point in listening because Brad, you know nothing that I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you for those words, Paul. I appreciate it, man. You know, it's like, obviously I want my horsey to run as good as he can. And, you know, being that my better days are behind me, that's, that's really what I live for. I can't wait until Paul and I start winning again. It's just, it's the best dude. You know, Paul does so much for the game and has and competed for so long. And you won't find a more, uh, just, I mean, you talk about giving it to your all this guy, he, he doesn't even need to eat. He's like, I'm ready to play. I don't need food. I don't need air. Get away from me. <laughs> I, I need nothing. I'm always trying to, man, what, you, you need Get this little, oxygen out of my face. <laughs> you need to say, Brad, I'll take a drink of water when I'm thirsty. Numb skull. I'm a grown man. Uh, <laughs> it's just the best. dude. he's so he, when he goes into that place and listen, that was tough for me because my initial vision was like, dude, me and Uli and I are just going to be out there. Just what do we got here? Oh, we got a little headwind. Yeah. Off the, off the lake, 270 cover, you know, 350 back edge. You want me to miss this long and left, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, baby. Just keep it left. You know, you miss his left, throw it hard. Keep it left. No, 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 no. Let daddy cook. <laughs> <laughs> Clam up, kid. You know, I don't care if you're God and the all knowing disc golfer of the universe. <laughs> and, and it's true. You know, he, he knows everything he needs to know. He does. And, uh, so it's really just staying out of his way, basically. And at first I felt, and he even told me, he's like, listen, numbskull, you're not hearing what I'm saying to you. <laughs> Shut your pile. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it down, bro. <laughs> hey, you see your knuckles? Yeah, those are for knuckle bumps. <laughs> Dirty. Do you understand? Uh, and you know, and I finally I had to sculpt uh, my my caddying. So, uh, but it's great. It, it's been the and I felt like there was a big turning point where I was like, hey. All I got to do is shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he kept telling me. He's like, dude, I gave you the simplest job in the world. <laughs> shut your mouth. I don't care. I told him, I told him the first week on the bag, I said, this is all I need from you, man. <laughs> you carry the bag, silence. If I talk to you, let's talk back. Be there waiting with a fist pump <laughs> for two months straight. What do we got here, Rolls? He's like, right here next to me. I'm like, oh my gosh. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's like, what are we doing here? He's like, dude, you're so, up my brain. I don't uh, need to hear that. And I was like, but it's sound advice. <laughs> <laughs> 
It doesn't matter. Don't you understand? <laughs> what did I, I said one time, I told him, I said, I go, it was kind of a big pot or something. I go, take your time, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. How much time do I have to take here? <laughs> what did this clown just say to me? What, uh, what prescription was just imagine, imagine silence the whole time. And then all of a sudden you got a putt and he goes, first words ever. <laughs> Take your time here. I'm like, like, what's going on? Am I about to win the tournament? <laughs> what's happening? Uh, oh, so fun. Oh man. Yeah. Oh. All right, Brad. Well, we, we can't go we can't go over three hours. Silas will Silas will punch me in the Sorry, face. Silas. Um uh-huh. He, oh, he's on East Coast. Well, you're Yuli's on East Coast time too. No. Um, yeah. But before we before we let you go, we got to okay. know. Yeah. One of our favorite things here. One of our favorite listener things here. When we have new guests on, we ask them their biggest pet peeves. So something that really ticks you off that either happens while you play disc golf, while sure. you watch disc golf, anything. Anything in that realm? Is it? Yeah. Is there anything that really gets under your skin? Uh, you know, like I say, that was basically the root of the problem with me and uh, my existence on tour is that I always wanted a a professional environment and which is basically just, you know, quiet on the set. It's just like on the PGA tour. That's why they hold up these signs to say, hush y'all, you know, when a golfer is golfing, uh, it's kind of imperative that he's afforded, you know, his time on the course uh, as a professional, the way his time should be, which is not being distracted, you know, and I know there's distractions everywhere from one form or another, but in my opinion, as far as within the group goes, you should go out of your way to make sure you're not distracting your fellow players. And, uh, so as long as you don't distract me, but you know, somebody chirping me up like cupcake and I are still are at each other's throats. We, we haven't resolved it because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we went to, uh, Mount Airy forest where, uh, I had one of my, probably my greatest win in singles. And I believe it was 1997. It was one of the toughest courses at the time. Still pretty tough. We played it. I, I wasn't throwing it very good that day, but uh, I did make an ace on film, which was nice. But uh, I told the guys when I got there, I go, listen, guys, this is a really special place for me. You know, I got one foot in the grave. I don't know if I'll ever be back here. You know, I, I just will really want to enjoy the day kind of like a pro. So can you please just afford me silence, quiet on the set, <laughs> when I'm throwing my shots, <laughs> can you manage to control your humanity <laughs> in a way that you're not moving or creating distracting sounds 35 <laughs> seconds at a time while I'm throwing my shot. Couldn't do it. <laughs> the guy couldn't do it. It's like Ron White said, dude, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> I hate to say that, uh, cup, but, uh, that's the way I felt about it, you know? So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know how I feel and I love you brother and we're brothers and, uh, we'll get it back together eventually. But, uh, <laughs> uh so that, that for me, uh, just don't distract me when I'm throwing a golf shot and I'm one of the greatest guys ever. But if you distract me, you know, it's like, if you push the koala bear into the, in the corner and jab him with the, with the, with the, with the, with the red, you know, over and over, eventually the claws come out, you know, and that's never good for anybody. It's not a good, so that's my, let so, the professional enjoy his professional time. He's out there living and breathing and dying for the sport because, uh, I think that's kind of how I play. I'm like a tiger woods. I go into a bubble. I'm demanding perfection. I want a peak performance and I don't need somebody distracting me unnecessarily. That's my pet peeve. So are you, you're out, I'm assuming on the guys that bring like the stereo and play their music during, during like C tiers and stuff. You know, you know, uh, if it's a, if it's a small time event, I I'm good with it. You know, I, Hey, let's party, let's rock and roll. If it's, if it's a fun zone or whatever, but if I'm on a pro tour, buddy, let me take my shot without any problems, please. That, that, that That's just it. And, and, and like I said, I feel that that's, an intrinsic part of the game, uh, the game itself, as in life, you know, there's a spiritual aspect to it, whether you believe in God or whatever, 
energy, whatever you want to call it. It's been my experience that, you know, you should get what you uh, uh, project out there and you deserve to. So if, if, if you provide good etiquette, you should receive it in return. And uh, I felt like that's where it was kind of the scales were a little tip because I was always I, I went out of my way to make sure I was never distracting anyone. Not that I was perfect. We all kind of move ahead of the lie a little bit here and there. But then a simple, hey, can you back up? You know, it is there is uh, some of the uh, responsibility. Obviously, it's on the player if he's being distracted. But, uh, you know, I think it's just such a simple thing to me and should just come naturally with the sport when you're out there is, uh, you know, go out of your way to make sure you don't distract a fellow professional because I, I'm sure you don't want to be distracted either. And that, that's kind of the way I look at it. I love it. Is yeah. It I love it. Well, me and Brad, uh, I, I, I will say as long as you don't do it in practice rounds, I think me and you would be fine. Cause I, uh, for those that have played practice rounds with me, I pretty much talk the entire time. Yeah, uh, yeah, that- yeah, that's beautiful. Derm rounds a little bit different. Uh, Yuli, you got anything else for Brad before we let him go? Brad, all the guys on tour, who do you look at and they have a skill set that you're like, oh, I like that. I, I wish I had that. Oh, gosh. Plenty of people. I mean, you know. Shit, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I throw at 240 feet. <laughs> No, uh, you know, impressive. I mean, Gannon Burr, I mean, smooth as silk, like a computer. Uh, look at Ricky Wysocki stepping up there with those side arms and backhands and that putt of his. I mean, dude, big ools, the way you putt, the way you play, the way you recover, the way you fillet fairways. Uh, a lot of these guys, I mean, what what is Isaac Robinson doing out there with that little jukity juke and it goes <laughs> Uh, Ezra Robinson, Brandon Lotta smashes the disc, dude. What about Sir Silas Schultz? I mean, and of course, you watch the great one, AB. I mean, what a, I mean, the guy's like some kind of Greek god out there throwing it farther than anybody and just playing like an animal. Uh, all the, all the great guys, man. I mean, it, that, that's, that's another big bonus that comes with caddy. And I get to see the greatest players out there, you know, and there's well, a lot it helps when you're, when your player is good. It does. It does. Uh, sorry to all my caddies this year. Apologies. Um, who do you, who do you got this? Who do you got this week, Brad, before we go, give us predictions. I got double G. Uh, Garrett Gurthy. Uh, well, you didn't even list him as one of your guys. <laughs> Huh? You didn't even listen as one of your guys. Well, okay, he's gonna finish. Why, okay, why you got all right, all right. Bring, bring me well, to it. Bring me to it. Here you go. Me, one of the guys that impresses me. No, who do you got to win the tournament? Yeah, who do you got to win the double tournament? Double G. Oh, to win this week. I thought you meant who do you got on the back? Because I'm gonna caddy for double G. <laughs> and so, you, and so you better oh, so you have think he's gonna G win. The win, yes. Well, here's the thing. Double G. Uh, at the Worlds, I was on his bag, and before it started, man, he looked like a winner. I thought he was going to win, or at least be up there pretty good, and he didn't play as well. But that being said, I know he's playing well. He's throwing it well, and uh, I just asked him to try and get in a lot of putting practice this week, and I used the phrase that Uli said. Uh, I told him, I said, you just keep saying this to yourself, Garrett. I'm Garrett Gurthy, and good things happen to me because I deserve them. And he goes, "You got it, buddy." So I'm hoping he took that to heart. And I uh, love that. Yeah, I th- I think I know I love that too. You know, and uh, I think Double G's going to play well. I really do. I haven't practiced with him this week. There's been other stuff going on, and he's practiced on his own. But uh, he knows this course, and he's very accurate off the tee, plenty long, and a streaky putter. But when he gets it going. Double G can play. And I, I'm going to try and interject some fire into his game. You know, it's one of those things hopping around from bag to bag. Like I've been doing recently. I don't really, I'm not sure I make the right choices. My approach is to how to approach each player. You know, do I say this? Do I say that? You know, I, I felt like I got through that. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> I, I bet, yeah. Don't rush this dude. Whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing you want to do right now is to rush this. <laughs> yeah, never run. And don't worry about the OB pit on the left, bro. 
<laughs> no, but uh, uh, I felt like I got through to AB on the, the third and fourth rounds, and he played really great. And what I told him was when we were walking up there, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Uli's kind of got me in a place where I, I try not to say things as much because I don't want to distract my guy. I don't want to interject too much because he. I just need to let daddy cook. So I don't interject <laughs> And uh, so, but with AB, I was like, you know what? I tried the first two days. I didn't interject anything. And on the third day, I go, hey, and the night before, we went to Cascade Falls, and they got a tiki course set up. And he made some putts and was pumping his fist like he was winning a tournament. And I was like, that's it, AB. That's what I want the rest of the weekend. That's how you're going to play disc golf this weekend. And then that next day, I go, I'm not taking no for an answer, AB. You're going to play good today, buddy. We're making a bunch of birdies, you know, and he, he likes rap music and he had this thing. And I threw something about that, uh, rhymed with the tune. I was something about <laughs> more birds. I forget what it was. I like to do that. And I, I was telling him that, and man, he played incredibly. He could have shredded that thing. If I could have had him even on half that mode, the first two rounds, he's got a real easy win there. I think. Dang. Yeah. AB's playing so good, you know, he's, he's a little streaky too. And, you know, like, like we say, like, that's why I like to talk shop with people because that's the very kind of thing like that. I think if more people played with the fire that I played with, with the fire that Uli plays with, that the fire that, you know, when people are playing great golf, I feel like there's usually some fire in there and uh, I think they'd play better. So, you know, that's, I, th- I feel like I have a more of a mental, uh, 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 thing that I could share with people, maybe more than my skill set, because like I say, I'm I'm kind of an idiot savant. Although I think my technique is kind of sound. Like uh, uh, Uli says, I, I'll hit a fairway on you, and I, I can make some putts. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, pretty much. Love it, love it. Well, Brad, right. this has been awesome. We appreciate. It. We're we're definitely gonna have to have you back because yeah. I, I feel like you weren't able to say all the stories that you got up there. So we'll have Dude. to have you back at some point. Man, Brody, thanks a bunch. Uh, you know, uh, Uli threw this curveball at me out of the blue. Hey, you're on, you're on podcast. You're on with us on tour like tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I got a billion stories. You could have me on fifty times. You'd never get enough. You'd never get it all. Well, so that's thank- awesome. Yeah, thank- we appreciate it. Uh, have fun this week. I hope Double G does good, but not too good to where uh, he takes you. You know, takes you away from Uli. You know, what if Double G wins and then just. Hey, my, hey, that's a nice bonus check for my guy. So I'm root. I, yeah. I, I would love that. Okay. Hey, All right. A little competition there, maybe. Hey, I'd love for Double G to win, but it'd just be like Kevin McCoy and Coda Hatfield. I'd be like, he goes, so Brad, we're going to run this back. I'm like, oh, he's feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> See you. See you. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, All right, Brad. We appreciate it, brother. Have fun this week, man. You too, man. Thank you.